All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you. So, um, thank, Miranda, that was brilliant. I love it. I hate to follow you, but I will. So I'm going to present in a very different way. So I don't have notes. I have my loose leaf books. This is a project that uh, what I'll talk about today that is 10 years running and ongoing. So first of all, I'm a full professor and chair of the Department of Design and Computation Arts. My research creation follows a path that everything I do wants to be embedded into pedagogy. I've worked very long and hard on all levels of sustainability at the university level. And after, I'd say, 15 years, this is the point where we are recognized for our efforts. The university is supporting and engaging in sustainability. The, one of the talks that I hope you'll look at is a mapping of all the sustainability efforts and groups around the university. And I must admit that student-driven projects are absolutely extraordinary. For example, this, um, I must say that Insight Symposium that you're uh, watching today is designed uh, very heavily by my very small team with big ideas who finished 391 and 392 just one year ago. So that would be Claire Lecker, Patricio McClellan, and Elizabeth, I'm not sure if you're here, or Sarah Ponte Major. So um, just think of these are the kinds of things that you can go, whether you're a maker, a designer, a creative director, having the knowledge of sustainability in all aspects can bring you into a very powerful place in the workforce. So with that, I actually work from hybrid, hy a hybrid, hybrid model, traditional digital mediums to inform garment making, poems, book works, and performative events. I work collaboratively with, uh, as I say, students, uh, and uh, people from other disciplines, experts, and so on. So uh, I'm driven by the poetics and the politics of meaning, making, being, and behaving. And uh, my two main programs of research, which are very long term, I really only work at one or two projects for many, many years at a time. Uh, obsessive, perhaps. So the first one is Wild Cities Beyond the Human-Centric Point of View. And this outlines a strategy for circumventing opposites. What does this mean exactly? It is a search for ways to disrupt the continuation of how we currently construct our urban space as a disconnect within habitats, habitat, habits, and ha inhabitants. So Wild Cities asks us, what would designing beyond the human-centric view be in terms of changing individual and collective patterns of being and behaving? Would we move away from our human isolation and understand the deep connections and interdependence on flora and fauna? Because truly sustainable cities honor biodiversity, biophilia, and ecological resilience. And at the bottom is an active link that you can take a look at. I gave a talk in Alberta uh, at the Walrus uh, Academic uh, Lectures. And then immediately after, I ran off to the Wolf Dog Sanctuary where <clears throat> I got to see the damage that human breeding does to uh, when you breed a wolf with a domestic dog. Uh, and that sanctuaries have to be um, provide for these animals because they are still partially wild and you can't control them in the domestic violence. So here is what I call the um, invasive species being humankind. The talk that I'm going to talk about today is the parachute unfolds, follow the thread. The reason why I'm going to speak from myself and my book works, everything I do is sort of unfolded. Book works, they can come together, they can unfold, they can be worn. So this, for example, 
is my research printed on silk. It can be folded up into um, just a very small square. I can stick it in my pocket. I can wear it. I can wear my research. And this is where I am constantly reminded that I must challenge myself and not finish what I start because every time you follow the thread, you uncover quite extraordinary things. Why the parachute? Okay, parachute, World War I. So the parachute is this luxurious, um, tactile, made uh, Chinese, the silkworm, for example, is the live creature. Um, the ecology of how we use the silkworm <coughs> Sorry, I hope I don't lose my voice. So even how we handle a silkworm, a very tiny creature, is still part of the ecological part of making. There are sustainable ways now of making silk, but not part of the commercial industry. So we go back to silk, centuries, and the Chinese, and the Japanese, beautiful kimonos, the rich, luxuri luxurious material lightweight, um, resist, resistant, resilient, all the properties that we um, aspire to in terms of uh, clothing or, and for royalty many, many times. But at a time of war, a time of crisis, um, silk was used as these parachutes to carry men down from their pilots, uh, animals sometimes, supplies, and so on. So, for example, this is also, all my artifacts here, except for this, are original uh, military de uh, decommissioned parachute objects. So part of my research was uh, on eBay negotiating and dialoguing with military collectors who are a very different sort of uh, membership uh, than artists. I never told them what I was doing with their parachutes, but here I bought, for example, that is a full human parachute over there uh, that is 26 feet in circumference. This, I have no idea what it is, but um, it probably was carrying some objects from a larger parachute. Um, so the story of war, crisis, uh, men, humankind at its worst, at its most competitive. And sometimes I wonder if we really are the most brilliant species in the world, if we can never stop warring. But with that, the resilience of humankind during a crisis situation is when you also see when sustainability is embedded, is embraced, is a necessity, and which grows. So. I hate to think of us in a position of being in crisis before we learn, make, redo, relook at things, but sometimes that's where we get a huge influence. So my research is historic, uh, but it's based on interviews in France. So I, uh, over the years, I've had a large team. Sandra Volney, for example, a PhD student, she went over to France, her home country, and actually interviewed people in communities to talk about the stories of their grandmothers. Uh, a grandmother who got married to her pilot lover uh, in a re parachute uh, <coughs> from a pilot, either a German pilot who had been shot down and they would gather the parachutes up in the fields and then use them to sew garments or wedding dresses. So this is a reality. I'm not just, I'm reinterpreting the wedding dress in my uh, parachutes, but they are authentic. They are hand sewn. So I'm following the thread or pulling the thread. I can pull the thread from all of my parachutes and bring them back into the original parachute shape. So my work is always do one thing, undo one thing, follow a thread another way, and build something. So some of the examples I want to talk about, women in the workforce. So women were pilots for, per se. That was designated to the brave men who most likely, very strong likelihood, they would at some point get shot down. So the women packed and unpacked the parachutes at the beginning of the war 
for them. Uh, and you have things like, such as um, uh, be very aware, so candidates who refused to jump were automatically failed and returned to their units. So bravery was a huge part of being a pilot. And the women who were responsible for folding and unfolding the parachutes, their job was to keep their men safe. It's interesting to note that a lot of these women went into the factories, men at war, but they were still required to wear red lipstick and look presentable as a female during their work, whether they were cutting logs in the open fields or whether they were making bombs. The other thing is Japanese internment. So there were Japanese women that were folding parachutes at the time, but they were monitored by military officers with the idea that they might fold the parachute wrong and kill a pilot. So these are facts. These are just amazing facts about things. The resilience, this is interesting. So these are authentic, but I've remade them. These are escape maps. So parachutes, uh, parachutists who were, uh, pilots who were shot down, they would have these little, it's not pure silk, it's kind of like a, a, a waterproof, but they called it a silk. And what this did, they were always about this size, so this is made from uh, two escape maps. What are they used for? First of all, a par uh, pilot shot down where? These are maps. If he did get shot down, he would be able to walk on land and be able to find the nearest point. So uh, th they're resilient. They could hide inside the pocket and hopefully not get uh, seen by the um, enemy. Um, then, of course, why did I do this? Because women made their lingerie pre-post. Uh, war before economics started to uh, take women out of industry, put them back into the home, and um, uh, have men come back and work as they as they were supposed to. But the revolution of women working equal jobs e uh, e during war is something really, really important. So, with that, um, how am I doing for time? 15 minutes? Yeah. Sorry? Let's do 25. Okay, just give me a five minute warning, okay? Because I could talk probably forever. <coughs> I do to myself. Uh, these are all authentic. So I have uh, one parachute that actually indicates a, an Australian pilot shot down, interned in a Japanese war camp, written in, so I don't know what it is, it's a red kind of paint. So it dates when he was in the, um, in the intern. So I have that original parachute. I can't tell who it's from. I can't return it to a family. Doesn't give me enough information. But please do not cut the string. Think of the other fellow. Keep me moving. Keep him flying. So here you see the politics, the poetics, uh, the social aspect, the individual collective, all coming together within, whether it's in a propaganda form or whether it's in, um, a, and I must admit, most of my research has been focused in um, Manchester, which is where my family is from, and Brixton. Uh, so there's the Imperial War Museum uh, I visited so many times. Uh, which is, gives me so much information about the British war effort. Um, the good and the bad. I don't pretend that we, um, in, the, in wars, it's very difficult to say who was good, bad behaviors, individual. We see that now with Ukraine and Russia. It's, it's, it's very hard to untangle what is happening in the war, but we, um, yeah, um, I don't know how to complete that sentence. So with my parachute dresses, I've made about uh, five. I've uh, 
shown them once in a Eureka Festival, which was an outdoor fashion festival, and once at the Fofa Gallery in 2016. Since then, oh, actually, <laughs> um, can you play that? Sorry, I'm not even turning my pages. <laughs> actually another uh, the, so video we projected this out at night onto the street and I guess also this is about following the thread literally but it is one of the wedding dresses and it actually we built it so that most of the dress could pack up into a bustle behind so learning to pack a parachute is extraordinarily difficult but again it's the detailing of trying to understand your research by doing and making, which I, I think is so much about the designer and the artistic practice. So taking your research, interpreting, relating, producing, and doing iterations. So for example, this is a parachute dress, very wearable actually, slightly translucent. And what I've left it to do is silk as a natural fiber. Eventually, it will disintegrate totally and I'm letting it do that to see the properties of the history of this parachute kind of thing. So I don't, uh, you know, as in fashion, I don't create holes. These are holes that are either mothed or um, from sunlight, and probably this is from 1953. So again, we see the resilience of the fabric over, uh, what, 60, 70 years. Um, okay, these are propaganda, so you see women in the workforce um, for graphic design and propaganda and commercialization of women's place in the work, workforce. Um, this is all encompassed in the sociopolitical aspect from one thing starting with the silk parachute. So it is an armature with extraordinary beauty, luxurious uh, materiality, but also embedded in those meanings is you have an unfolding of the whole history of war. Um, also the idea of sustainability and where. So during the war, uh, France actually, where uh, companies that manufactured women's lingerie and men's uh, silk shirts and so on. They turned the, their manufacturing over to the war machine during the war. And then post-war, you have uh, les advertisements like les parachutes français de la, foi, de la soie française. So they actually made, it's too small to see here, but advertising, say, bring back your silk so that we can start manufacturing uh, luxurious items again because we don't have a stock of silk that belongs still to the enemy. And actually, I would say that uh, in the United States, 
a huge motivation for uh, the production of nylon was to not be re reliant on Japanese, the enemy silk, but also what came out of it is the first women's stockings. So during the war, we, if women did not have any money at all, that's where you see the line drawn up the back of their leg to fake the nylon, and that's where nylons became very popular with men, women, also to re-feminize them as well. So whether I go from a feminist view, a military collector view, uh, an interpretive view as an crea uh, artist creator, um, or a collaborator with uh, dancers and performers, uh, that video was built by my research assistant and my graduate student, Isadora, or Augustina Isidori. Um, and how am I doing? How much time? Oh, okay. Um, the interesting thing then I find, as you, as you follow the thread, you find out interesting things. So one of the things is aircraft, and you may see this, was painted black and white to confuse uh, the enemy airplanes in the air. But then farmers started painting their cows black and white so that they would be um, visible at night so that um, uh, farmers, military vehicles, and so on would not crash into the cows as they went by. But whether that made the cow any more visible to the enemy is, you see, this is all what's happening in terms of, I think Miranda mentioned about, and Andre about invasive species is one, pre one problem creates another problem. Uh, you try and find a solution and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, yeah, so the poetics of, yeah, here's what I need to do, right? Oh, I've lost my, where'd it go? Start sharing again. try and just be a little bit organized here. So the parachute unfolds. Context, textile, scripted cloth, resilience and silence. Relational, relationscapes, map of the person and territory, follow flight, follow inanimate threads, animate threads, woven into the war machine, invisible or visible force of women, men at work. The wedding gown or the weight of men, luxurious silk. What is not destroyed is purposed or repurposed and reveiled again. Simple and complex within. The sublime nature of thought, performative, poetic, and politicized. Gestures adrift, layers of materiality and meaning from military war to fashion wear. What is worn out or rich or old stories mindful of history, but not bound by it. This is my website, which has recently disappeared. So you can see that there are four components, uh, FOFA gallery, gray nuns, uh, the black box. We did a lot of experiments in the black box as well, which is uh, a beautiful space in the subsection of the EV building. Some of the images, and here again I was, uh, from one of the talks today, we talk about the idea of working with discarded materials, recycled materials, even garbage, uh, silk, and so on. Well, I think that the artist and the designer, you don't need to be afraid of that. Is that your interpretation, or as uh, Vanessa this morning expressed it, it's how we breathe. It's we breathe in, we breathe out, we articulate through representation and aesthetics. So don't be worried that you're experimenting and it looks a bit odd or you're not sure whether it's beautiful for iterations will bring you back to the natural beauty of interpretation. That's why we do create. So there are some of the parachute dresses, just different images. 
And this is uh, just a scene of the gallery and the number of dresses that we produced. Uh, and then Morgan Latik and um, uh, Andrea Pena, uh, various dancers who really knew how to move with such a vol voluminous uh, 13 to 26 feet of fabric. It's really a dancer who can understand how to move within and around with that. Um, I also experimented with uh, Morgan. You can't see it very. Morgan is wearing uh, other underwear garments that uh <coughs> I made from silk. There's an original corset that I restructured as well. And the beauty of some of these images taken by Augustina, again, the parachute itself is so beautiful, but practical. So it has form and function. And then you get the camera's eye and the photographics, photographer's eye. And the extraordinary beauty is then unfolded. Air is really important because they, uh, these parachutes are so extraordinarily beautiful, whether it's in natural wind or uh, artificial um, fanning. There's, um, so making underwear out of uh, the escape maps up to the side, all wearable. All you, we could reproduce them, but that's not my interest um, to do that. But if somebody asked me for them, I would make them a pair, absolutely. Two minutes, good. Um, and there's just other views of the work. There's the parachute in the middle that can fold up into itself and be carried as a knapsack on your back. There's the book that I say, you know, like my talk, it's nonlinear, but I'm unfolding threads. So I do respect academic rigor, but I, in my research and in my creation, I can't be restricted, not constrained by it, or I'm not gonna say restricted. I sometimes have to leave it in order to be free in my studio, just to experiment, just to say it's okay, to do whatever I need to do in order to reach satisfaction. And again, I rely very heavily on graphic design, soft surface structuring, uh, objects in space, exhibition or public spaces. All of that to me is integrated for in the eye of the designer. Um, we need to work from the microcosm or view to the macro view. Who are we in society? And I think through the parachute, this is what I've incredibly encountered is a very rich, rich way for me to understand my place in society, my responsibility, my being and behavior. Even if through the absolute worst crisis war that humans can go, th go through, resilience is such an, a, a strong, strong aspect of this. My hope in the future is that without crisis, that you embrace, you're optim you are optimistic about uh, bringing some kind of ethical uh, sense into our capitalist society and um, so on. <coughs> and keeps going on and on and on. Uh, early porno pornographic images and the parachute. parachute. Thank you. Oh, please be that. <laughs> um, 
knowing about, um, does it work? Yeah. yeah? Um, uh, how you talked about the politics of meaning making and the making of these dresses. Um, I was wondering how, because uh, you know, a lot of design, if we look at the etymology of the word is designate, so it's to oftentimes just give a name to something. And uh, I was wondering if you could, or uh, call them fashion, if, if, if those dresses could enter, or if we should rather try and elaborate new languages, such as a soft surface, uh, that are not as implemented with it a capitalistic um, system. And I was just wondering where do these very deeply symbolic creations stand within the creator's point of view? Hmm. That's interesting. I don't know if I have an answer for that, but for example, before I came into the university, I was a special effects and prop maker and costume designer in film, most wasteful industry in the whole world. And as, as seductive as it is, uh, I realized if I stayed in the industry, it would, it would hurt me very badly, mentally, physically, and so on. It's, uh, it's still today, the ev even with unions, it's hardcore, 12 hours a day, and so on. So I think from that, I learned that my language, my voice, uh, had to do with um, taking all of those things I learned in film and bringing it into research creation where even if I produce one-off or even if I started a company and produced wedding dresses made out of parachutes, it, it's, I don't do multiples, I do iterations. And like I say, if somebody asks me for something, I will build it. But the idea is, and especially in the design program and design education, where we have relied very heavily, but rightfully so, on wood, metal, plastic in terms of building, furniture, and so on, and display. Uh, the three, uh, the four of us are very interested in showing you that something as lightweight as silk can be structural, has, can carry, and can blow, can be hold 26 feet, can be inflated, can be structural. Um, it's, it's how you take the patterning uh, from a flat surface, and maybe you have some armatures such as tents and so on, but soft surface, I think, and in terms of biomaterials and moving forward in sustainability, and even for the fashion industry, for those who will go into that industry, I think mine is just an interpretation, a demonstration of the materiality itself, the optimism around uh, different materials for structures, whether they're tiny little objects or um, buildings even, uh, temporary, nomadic, uh, that's also about sustainability. Why are we always building these monolithic stationary things when we can have nomadic armatures, architecture, uh, that follow the wind, that use the wind, that um, uh, use the snow? Does that, I, I, it's, it's probably, I can only speak from the poetics and the politics of of my language of interpretation. I'm not that practical that I could ever go into business, whatever. So that, that's not what I feel I contribute, uh, but I hope it turns into something that students can pick up and carry through in very practical ways or not. Does that make sense? Does that answer at all? Have you looked at using either parachutes or fabric from other war efforts or like other areas other than Western Europe in your practice? Yes, uh, one of the last parachutes I showed is from Eastern Europe. It's made of cotton. So twice as heavy, uh, won't dry properly. Uh, poor country, the disadvantages of countries at war with money and without, 
uh, I can't see it as being very safe because I've had it out and ex it, you know looked at its properties. Um, I work with animals uh, a lot, so I'm looking at. Uh, th I think there's a little book around here somewhere in my pile on animals and war. So again, I'm looking at the idea, for example, um, rats. We hate rats in the urban environment. Uh, although panda, giant panda rats in Cambodia and war-torn countries, the rats are trained, are domesticated as pets or, or service animals because they are much more efficient than dogs, humans, even technology to uh, suss out, smell out uh, mines that are still underground. So I, I, I'll jump from the parachute to a rat if, if my narrative unfolds that way. So war, interesting enough, I hate war, but it is such an interesting path to look at in terms of behavior and uh, technology. Um, the war machine, even post-war, bringing women back into the kitchen, uh, to the mechanical bride. You can no longer work because our men are back, so we're gonna make your life easy. Dishwashers, new refrigerators, let's keep the woman in the house again. So it's so, it just keeps unfolding in, its, in, in such wondrous ways. Does that answer at all? Thank you. Anybody want to get married in a parachute dress? Um, yes, I got one. me please. Um, <laughs> yeah, one more question actually, um, and they're fairly easy, but I was wondering how long it took for this whole project to take, and um, was it difficult trying to find sellers online for each of the parachutes you bought? A yes and yes. So yes and like <laughs> I say, I started this project um, by accident uh, from uh, I was in di diverse as my lab and my research area, and I always have been working with uh, dancers and uh, cloth that moves. Uh, I did have my own line of sustainable linen garments, but I, like I said, I'm not very good at producing more than one. Um, so it was by accident that I entered into it around 2010, and then. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second part? Oh, yes. So dealing with military collectors online, eBay, extraordinarily difficult because they know the history of an object and its value or its place in history, but they certainly do not know the difference between silk and nylon <laughs> so, or what it was used for, which is interesting. So a real negotiation and then sometimes, and they're all, they're all men, so that's why partially why I use PK instead of my name. I, I needed to be a military collector uh, in order to negotiate through their, um, their c community uh, because it's a, you know, it, it's, it's a very specific community. I had to learn a language, how to speak to these guys without saying, hey, what's it made out of? I had to say, you know, things like, um, have you ever taken a piece of the fabric and burnt it? Does it, does it crumple? Because natural fibers will flame. Polyesters will create a black uh, mold. And then if they say, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard anyone say, then I, I have to go, apologies, I didn't mean, you know, so yes, online, eBay, terrific negotiations. And finding affordable parachutes, uh, also difficult, but very, very interesting. This is a whole world that I had no idea about and how firmly people are passionate about memorial and war. Like, so, yeah, okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, so, have you 
since the project's finalization, have you spoken to any, either the, those collectors that you worked with or any, anyone who's been involved in, like, in the military in the past, whether it's veterans or historians or anything like that? Have, have you discussed with the, about the project with them since finishing it? Well, I haven't finished. Well, yeah. <laughs> I was still making. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so as I say, most of that was located in France or in Britain when I was at the War mu uh, uh, Museum. Sometimes I would be talking to the uh, museum people or um, anecdotally, actually the last garment, which is, I, I forgot to bring it, is um, a pair of uh, bloomers made out of uh, silk and uh, um, the war map. And oddly enough, Miriam Forte, who's third year now design, um, she sent me along with it pictures of her grandfather and D-Day and so on. So, you know, the, again, the unfolding is just, it's a small world where everyone, well, not everyone, but most of us have some kind of historical relationship to war. One of my colleagues is Japanese, and she remembers the internment and so on. So, um, yes, and s again, it is stories of resilience, uh, stories of why did we behave this way during war, but also it shows the remarkable, you know, humanity. Uh, so it, it's that very puzzling contradiction, entanglement that I'm very, very interested in. And likewise in the relationship between ourselves and other species in the urban environment, that's a very um, contradictory and uh, but interesting subject. You know, what do you do when the coyote comes into your backyard in Greenfield Park? and you have a tiny white dog that's used to being out in the backyard by itself, well, do you not let it out anymore? Do you cull the coyote? Uh, do you displace it? Um, do you keep your dog on a leash? You know, that we can be very sustainable and very optimistic about things until it hits home. There's, and, and that's the stories of war. That they continue, and I'll always be interested in them, right up until dementia. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, it's probably going to be more interesting. 